Good morning, City Church, or good afternoon, depending on the time that you're watching this. But again, we want to welcome every single one of you this wonderful Sunday morning. Thank you for spending your morning with us and starting the week strong with us. Look, September is almost over, and we're just excited to be with you today. My prayer is that I hope that the message today, it finds you well, it finds you strong, and I pray that this is a time that you gather your family together as you listen to the Word of God. If it's your first time, we've got amazing services that happen throughout the week. Wednesday nights for young adults at 7 o'clock p.m. Thursdays, we have a community Bible studies. Friday nights, we've got youth. Saturdays, we spend your, our mornings with your children. That's four to seven years old in the morning at 10 a.m. And then later on in the afternoon at 2 p.m., that's for our preteens. Yesterday, we had an amazing time with the youth. We had this new Zoom room called United, as in Y-O-United. Parents, if you've got teenagers, that will be a great avenue for your teenager to know more people, to know more about God, to know more about the Word. It was just a fantastic time of sharing and exchanging stories in the name of Jesus. All right? Well, today I'm happy and I'm excited because there's someone different that you're actually going to see on camera. You must be so tired of seeing me or Pastor Joe. I mean, I'm always in the midweek services. Pastor Joe is always here on a Sunday. So without any further ado, this is a wonderful woman of God. She's a great leader. She's a great pastor and she has a heart for people. Now, would you all welcome today this morning or this afternoon, depending on the time that you're watching, Pastor Grace Rivera. Good morning. If you are to evaluate your commitment from a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, what is your level of commitment? This is in regards to your job, career, relationship, your spouse, your family, your friend, in, in pursuit of your dream, walking in your calling and purpose in life, serving in church, and the following the Lord. What would it be like? Is Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26, relevant to the modern church today? Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save, his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man exchange for his soul? I have shared my life's testimony with some close friends, but today I'll be sharing it with you. Sharing my life's testimony is like revisiting my painful past and how the Lord turned it into victory. I am Grace Rivera, one of the pastoral staff of City Church. I help people to overcome their difficulties in life through counseling and prayer. What I'm doing is like a pay it forward for what God has done in my life. By the time I am done sharing, I pray that you will celebrate with me for what the things have done in my life and in yours. Fulfill, find your fulfillment in your God-given purpose and be complete in the person of Jesus Christ. Every time I'm asked to speak, I always align my thoughts with three questions. Why, how, what? Why is it important for me or necessary for me to share my life's testimony? Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him, the evil one, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. The second question is, how will I share my testimony? I have three segments. 
my life before Christ, my life when I met Christ, my life with Christ today. I started my life before Christ. I met my husband through a blind date set up by my board mate. We dated for a year and nine months. Then we got married when I was graduating in college. By the six months of marriage was romantic. Then it dried up slowly. Paul, my husband, was employed in the biggest brewery factory, San Miguel Corporation, drinking bottles or pails of beer every day was like drinking water daily. He came home drunk most, most of the time. There were so many fights, and in the span of four years, I threatened to leave him several times. He was into all forms of vices, and the last straw that hit me so hard was when he started smoking marijuana. When I, fa when I found out about this, I was really terrified, and leaving him was my only option. I confronted him about it, and it led to a heated argument. There was a time, that was the time I intended to leave. But he said that I cannot bring the children with me, my two daughters. And that moment I step up, and that moment I step out of the gate, there was no way of turning back. With that kind of marriage, I was scared to leave my children behind. What will be their future in such kind of atmosphere? Atmosphere. I stayed and persevered a chaotic marriage for the sake of the children. Our eldest daughter was sickly at that time, too. I was in a terrible situation. I was verbally and emotionally abused. There was no love and respect in our marriage. Since I decided to stay, I became vengeful. In retaliation to his verbal and emotional attacks, I turned out to be hard heart and became the worst person I can ever be. There were several th things I did to him when he came home drunk. When he was sober, I behaved well. It started with alienating from him. Either I slept with my children in their room or I let them sleep on our bed so he can sleep with me. You reject me, I'll reject you too. That was my survival principle. If by chance he slept on our bed, I kicked him off from the bed and found him sleep and found himself sleeping on the floor the next morning. I felt so good when I did that. The physical abuse I did to Paul escalated. One evening, I gave him two uppercuts right and left, knocked him down. Revenge became my best friend. With so much anger brewing in me, one very late night, I pushed him with my pointing finger on the last step of the stairs, and he fell tumbling down. He survived. I became a husband beater. I felt so good every time I hit him. But on the fourth year of our marriage, a divine intervention took place. A friend of ours persistently invited us to a three-day Life in the Spirit seminar. She said that I don't have to be good to come to the Lord, which was contrary to the belief that I had, that I was raised. I was raised that I have to be good before I can come to the Lord. Her words keep ringing in my heart, and it stirs within me. We attended the seminar and found it to be refreshing. 
the message was focused on Jesus Christ, especially his death on the cross. On the third day of the seminar, we were led to a prayer of acceptance, receiving Jesus Christ as our own personal Lord and Savior. We got born again together. I got baptized with the Holy Spirit while Paul was baptized a year later. That was how we met the Lord. God arrested us. There were still arguments and fights, but they became, they became lesser. A lot of changes took place. The desire for God was born. Paul started to come home right after work. He learned to be a father to our daughters. He became the husband that I was longing for. I opened up to him and confessed the things I did when he came home drunk. Our marriage was restored. Kathy, our eldest, was totally healed. God is the, God is the restorer of marriage. God is also the healer. Our friend Emmy invited us to Magellan Hotel and Restaurant where they fellowshiped every Sunday. The people were so friendly and welcomed us warmly. It was a good start for both of us. We were so hungry for God. We were discipled, and Paul's vices began to dismantle one by one. Our search for truth opened a new door of disciplines in life and the formation of new habits. We consistently attended the Sunday services and met new friends. Prayer, worship, and studying the Word of God became so vital in our walk with God. We developed family time too. On my end, the Lord began to soften my heart. For five years, God worked in my heart and taught me how to live in righteousness and holiness. Anger, resentment, vengefulness, lying, aggression, and the like began to diminish. Spending time with God in prayer and in his word had changed me. The Lord restored love and honor for each other. Love and honor became the foundation of our marriage. We renewed our marriage covenant, our marriage covenant with each other in sickness and in health, in persecution and in trial, in, per, in poverty and, on, and, and in abundance. We had to face together till death do us part. One day we prayed and asked the Lord to give us a son, and he also answered that prayer. The presence of God became surreal to us. First things first, we shared the gospel of Jesus to my family in the prologue. They received the Lord on Christmas Day. It was the greatest gift that we have given to my family. Forgiveness and restoration took place. While we were rejoicing that my family received Jesus, the opposite took, took place in the family of Paul. There was a great persecution at home. Since we lived with my parents-in-law at that time, my, my father-in-law started alienating from us. He didn't want to eat with us during breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When Paul was at work, there were so many, many insults, cursing words spoken against our faith, and I just said, in, and I just shed in tears and asked God for daily strength. After three years of prayer and holding on to Jesus for their salvation, to our surprise, Mommy got born again and gave his life to the Lord. Now she is now with the Lord. Daddy also softened up. Paul showed love to Daddy, served him until he gave his life to the Lord. The change in Paul's life was so undeniable that led Daddy to believe God's work in his life. They used to disagree in so many things, but 
because Paul was a rebellious son to Daddy. But before Daddy passed away, there was reconciliation, and Daddy gave his life to the Lord. As we grew with God, we were given the responsibility to teach Sunday schools, Sunday school classes. We serve in choir, worship team, welcome team, cleanup team. We just enjoyed serving. Under the leadership of the senior pastors, we learned about mission call. Mission call began to stir in our hearts. During our first missions convention, we were the first couple to heed to the mission's call. We believe that God's love, faithfulness, and goodness steered us to respond to his call, a burden to bring the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we go, grew in us. In heeding God's call, we took the first step by seeking counsel and prayer from our pastor. After days of prayer and fasting, the call became stronger. Then Paul decided to resign from his secure job. Our journey for mission began when he resigned. We were sent to a missionary sending church in Manila for six intensive, six month intensive training. After the training, we came back to Cebu and we were pioneer, pioneering a church in Karkar as a test run. There was no promise of financial support, but we were committed to serve. When we transferred to Karkar, the first thing we did was to enroll our two children to a private school or public school. But we were denied because of our faith. Persecution began. So we decided to enroll the children here in the city, in the public school, because that's the only, th that's the only fee that we can afford during the time. Paul and I had a dif the difficult situation during that time because, we, because he has to stay in Karkar for five days while I have to stay four to five days here in the city to keep watch over the children and help them in their studies. We traveled back and forth every week, and we only saw each other on a Sundays and Saturdays, on Saturdays and Sundays. It was a difficult setup for both of us because our family time, our finances were affected. We spent most of our savings for our daily sustenance and our travel. There were instances that we turned a day into fasting and prayer because there was nothing to eat. Personally, I'd rather take the suffering myself than see my children bear the suffering. Aside from that, there was a persecution from the religious church. The religious leader attacked us daily that we were promulgating a wrong belief. Fear was inciting in the hearts of the members. We assured the members about the promises of the word of God. The church grew to 80 members in the span of eight months, and they started giving. The members were so enthusiastic to study the word with us weekly. Back in the city, when the classes started, the children met new friends. I brought them to, I brought them to school and fetched them from school. One day, I have noticed that they were itching from their head down to their legs. Then I found out that their thighs and legs were swollen because of bug bites and their hair was infested with ticks. I was amazed. I was hysterical. But I treated them. Seeing them in such a heartbreaking condition, I wept before the Lord and asked, Is this the cause of serving you, Lord? If this is it, we have to go through all it all together. Give us the strength, Lord. Many tears were shed. 
Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13, reminds me. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to, be, uh, how to abound. Wherever and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The scripture became so real to us even until today. After 10 months, the Karkar ministry was endorsed to another pastor. When the school year ended, we were sent to Bangkok, Thailand for the mission's work. A day before we, we flew, Paul contacted his pastor friend regarding our arrival in Bangkok. We arrived at 5 p.m. in Bangkok the following day. We waited for the pastor who promised to fetch us. It was already 8 p.m. and there was no one to pick us up from the airport. The local pastor forgot to pick us up. Paul decided to take two taxis to fit every luggage we brought, thinking that we might be in Bangkok for quite a while. The streets were dimly lit because of the storm that hit the city a day before. We arrived in the Parsonese at past nine because the other taxi got installed, stalled, got stalled in the middle of the flooded road and we had to transfer everything in one taxi. We didn't have decent dinner. We just ate bread, crackers, drank water. We were so exhausted that we preferred sleep than eat. The following day, the pastor transferred us to a single room in a school building where their missionary, missionary, missionaries lived temporarily. A month later, we were able to settle down in a good house. The house was big enough for all of us, but it was not furnished. The first things we brought were mattresses and few kitchen appliances. We slept on the floor, ate our meals on the floor. It was, a, it was a new beginning for all of us. I never heard my, any, I never heard any complaint from the children. It seemed that they enjoyed playing house. There were instances that our support from the main church were delayed. The very last strand of our faith was about to snap, but God had been so good to bring in the provision in various ways. Paul and I were involved in teaching in the local church with an interpreter. But we were not able to stay long in Bangkok for two reasons. First, a resident visa was given to an American missionary couple. We had to exit Thailand to renew our tourist visa every three months. Penang, Malaysia was the nearest place where we can get our visas renewed quickly. In the span of 10 months, we live in Bangkok. We did our exit three times and it was financially and physically exhaustive, though the Chingra enjoyed the travel. The second reason I was, was I got so sick that the ob decided or advised me to have an oper immediate operation because the cyst in my right ovary had grown big and ready to erupt. I need the operation soon or else it will lead to an infection, an internal bleeding which is life-threatening. We asked the help of Auntie Pat, the aunt of Pastor Joe, if she can refer us for a second opinion. She accompanied, her, she, she accompanied us to her obigaini and gave, and the, the same diagnosis was given. Paul called up our pastor in Cebu 
and he advised us to come home in two weeks' time so I can be operated soon in Cebu because the surgery in Bangkok is twice the amount here in Cebu. So we said our goodbyes to Auntie Pat and thank her, thank her for her generosity and hospitality. So we pack up our things, sold the things that we need to sell, donated some of the items to the local church. I was so weak when we arrived here. The first thing I, we did was to have a checkup and show the diagnosis and ultrasound results from the doctor in Bangkok. I was scheduled for the surgery that day after we arrived. We checked in at Siwa Doctor's Hospital that evening. The day of surgery came. Early morning, I cried before God. For the first time in my life, I was overcome with much fear. It weakened my spirit, my soul, and my body. I asked Paul to pray for me. He prayed fervently until we received God's peace. At 6 a.m., the nurses prepared me for the surgery. Then I was wheeled to the operating room at 7. Then at 8 a.m., the operation took place. My ob assured us that the, sur the surgery was just a simple procedure and it will just take an hour or so. But the surgery took almost three hours, and Paul was already anxious. He stayed in the room and prayed. A miracle took place, though. The cyst that had already erupted, the cyst had already erupted, but its fluid was contained in its sac. They performed some tests to have the assurance that the fluid was not carried in my blood vessels or bloodstream. I was placed in the recovery room for two hours for close monitoring before I was wheeled back to my room. I was surrounded with loved ones, with good friends, prayer partners, that I was discharged for the, four days later. After a year, after a year later, after a year later, we continued the missionary call. We went to CDO, Kagyan de Oro City. Nothing stopped us from pursuing the call of God. We pioneered a church there for six years and started a church in the Polog simultaneously. Both churches grew and were generous. All throughout our journey with God, there were so many mountains to climb. Humps and bumps along the road, cliffs and valleys to pass through, but God was with us. He has been so faithful, and he showed us, and he showed us what is life in him. After six years, we endorsed the church in Sidio and Dipolog to the main church. So we came back to Cebu and established a church in Lapu Lapu City. This was the Bible study group of Pastor Joe that he endorsed back to the city or to the church after he left for Manila. In the process of time, the church grew and was very generous. We planned to buy quality pieces of sound equipment for our Sunday and midweek services. We submitted the budget and requested for it but it was denied because the church didn't have the funds or the budget to buy the equipment. We were taken aback with their response because we had just deposited a huge amount to the main church account. It was a good journey for a while until envy struck. We were falsely accused of malversation of offerings. Deposits were made every Sunday service, ev uh, after every Sunday service by our treasurer to China Bank Depository Account of the main church. Cash reports were recorded and receipts were even properly issued. Another accusation took place that was 
Paul was accused that he pushed people as he laid hands on them in prayer. The accusations came from people we love, we respected. We were broken during that time. We decided that, that not to begrudge them, but allow God to bring healing in our brokenness. There were many, there were many tears shed before the altar of the Lord. After we receive our healing, we resign from the church decently. We never talk against the church, though it left a big scar in our hearts. But God vindicated us and proven us innocent from their accusations. To, to summarize everything, persecution, false accusation, rejection, deprivation, even life-threatening experiences, those situations we carried, we encountered as we committed to follow the Lord. But those things also, those experiences form our characters. We have learned forgiveness because we were offended. We have learned healing and experienced healing because we experience brokenness. That's how the Lord worked in our lives. We pioneered church in, in the city, another church in the, we pioneered another church in the city. We started it in Sarosa International Hotel and Restaurant. After four months, the devil hit me hard with an uppercut that caused me to drop my knees and held on to God. That was when my husband passed away. So suddenly. Due to allergic reaction to the food he ingested. I was numb, shocked, disoriented. But by the grace of God, I used that painful scenario to my own advantage. I keep my relationship with God and make it stronger and better. Paul was my best friend, my partner in life, my colleague in the missionary works, my lover, my strength when I was weak, my leader, my pastor. He was just gone like that. After 21 years of marriage, the scripture says, life is like a vapor. He died at the prime of his life at the age of 46. There were a lot of questions. Questions that were unanswered at that time, but I stayed committed to the Lord. The more I held unto him, and this was my prayer, where will I go? You are everything I've got. On the last night of the wake service, which I called worship service, I quoted Second Samuel 24, 24 with my revision. I will not give an offering to the Lord, my God, with which cost me nothing. I offer Paul to you, Lord, the best of my offering. I have never given my best offering to God if I did not submit myself to the, pro to the process of self-sacrifice. The passage of scripture, of scripture that says, the maker is the husband to the widow and the father to the fatherless pacified me. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 10. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Listen. That the excellence of the power may, not, may be of God, not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed, 
always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus Christ, that the, that the life of Christ also may be manifested in our body. This verse kept me afloat. Preparing the messages for Sunday midweek services every week was so much of a burden while I was in the midst of mourning. It was getting harder. I didn't have someone to cry on when I was down, but I had learned to run and strengthen myself in the Lord. I know what is grit, G-R-I-T, holding on to what is secure, stable, and strong, and I have found that in the Lord Jesus Christ. I continued the Bible studies, ministered to the sick in the hospital or in their homes, trained the leaders, and at the same time, did the role of a father-mother to my three teenagers. The 40-member church was so generous, and we were able to purchase good quality sound equipment. When Pastor John Sheila decided to come back to Cebu and start a church, I offered my services and donated all the church instruments and joined with them from the start of City Church. I knew my calling by heart. My purpose is always behind the scenes to support the leader, the senior pastor, and bring encouragement to the people through counseling and prayer. Because I knew my purpose, I can say no to the things that do not align my pursuit for God's purpose in my life, and I, can lear and I learn to say yes to the things of God in accordance to his purpose for me. My life with Christ today, I'm so blessed, not with mater material things, not with millions of pesos in my account, but which with my experiences with God in my life's journey, which with my relationship with my children and their families, which with my relationship with my mom, which with my relationship with my siblings and their families, which with my faithful friends, which with the things of God, which with my relationship with people in church, relationship with the leaders and the staff. I am so blessed. And I thank God for every experience I had, either good or bad, because I learned to draw closer to my God. I thank God for the people whom I have whom the Lord permitted to cross my path in life to make me who I am today. In whatever season of my life, I have this confidence, God will never forsake me. I am not perfect or someone who had figured it out altogether, but one thing I treasure, I treasure the most, is the very presence of God. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank Pastor Joe, Sheila, and the family for being with us in the hardest times of our lives. What is your take home in the story of my life? Or what can you bring home after you listen to my story? I just want to give this to you. Life is not about us. It's all about him. It's all about the Lord. If you, have, if you want to have a better life, run to him. He is the life giver. He is the life changer. Secondly, life can never be achieved in its fullness apart from the Lord. Apart from the Lord. Fulfillment is found in pursuing God's purpose. And another thing, Life is complete in Jesus Christ alone. He is our all and in all. I have been a widow for 20 years, but I have found my completeness in him. My wholeness is the Lord. The pursuit of God's purpose was not easy. 
it was not an easy journey, but it's worth it because I have come to know the God I serve better. I can attest that the God I serve is trustworthy. That's the reason Isaiah 26, 3 to 4 is very real to me, and it has become my life verse at this season of my life. And I quote Isaiah 26, 3, 4. This is a song of Judah, a song of praise. You will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for Yahweh, the Lord, is everlasting strength. At this point, I, ju I just want to quote the scripture that I have quoted earlier about Matthew 16, 24 to 26, the cause of true discipleship. Jesus said, said this to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man be give in exchange for his soul? Three, three things in this particular message we're in, we can find what true discipleship is all about. Number one is self-denial. Self-sacrifice is God's way. And it's the only way we can find our real self. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4, it says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Number two, take up your cross. Suffering is part of life here on earth. Embrace it. Allow God to use it to make you better. It leads us to find the significance of life. I have learned two important things about suffering. The first is, the suffering I went through before Christ, it made me the worst of me. Secondly, the suffering that I went through when I gave my life to the Lord, it made me better. Those were the pruning shears in my life. Philippians 3.10 says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. It's a dying of oneself daily. His resurrection empowers us to identify with his sufferings and to be conformed to his death. The third one, follow Jesus. Follow him. He will show you how to live life to its fullest. Self-help is no help at all. He is our very help in time of need. Matthew 10, 38 says, and Jesus said it, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. No circumstances in life, either loss of life, loss of job, loss of wealth, loss of health, could either separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No trial, no temptation, no test is bigger than our Heavenly Father. He has deposited the Holy Spirit in us to lead us into a better life, and that is abundant life. Abundant life is not dependent on any circumstances. It is dependent on the grace of God. Gaging myself with the cost of true discipleship, I can say I'm still on the race, pressing on to lay hold of that of which Christ has laid hold of me toward the goal of the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's not over yet until he says, 
it's over. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence in our midst this time. I know that your Holy Spirit is with each one of us, touching lives. You are our healer. You are our provider, the, store, the restorer of our lives. You are everything that we need for life and godliness. Father, thank you for being with us today. And I pray, Father, that to those who are seeking you, they will find you at this moment in their lives. To those who are going to make any decision in life, a, cro a crossroad in their life, God, I pray for wisdom, guidance, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit to be upon them. For those who are desiring to find a new job and a better job, Lord, I pray for favor to rest upon them. This is always our portion daily as we continue to walk with you. Lord, you are a God who is always good, trustworthy, faithful. And no matter what circumstance, the circumstance of God that would come our way, you are always there for us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. You are always our strength. You are always our stability and our security, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you'll continue to reveal yourself to us as we seek you. For you said in your word, to those who seek you, they will find you, and you will all just reveal yourself to us, Lord. Father, thank you for your promises, our yes and amen to those who believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.